Hello and welcome back to the GI at E3 newscast. My name's Chris String. I am the head of Games Industry Biz, and we are joined by we've got a bumper lineup for our uh, end of E3 event today. We have the uh, editor in chief once again of Games Industry Biz, the uh, business veteran. His internet is playing up. He may disappear at any moment. Hello, James. How are you? Hello, my internet may be playing up, but at least my laptop's not in a cupboard. Yes, let's not go, <laughs> let's not go there. <laughs> um, uh, also joining us is the managing editor of Games Industry Shop is uh, uh, looking uh, particularly E3 tired today um, with, his, uh, with his shadow. Hello, Brendan, how are you doing? Hey, I am. Uh, it's not E3 tired. It's, it's just permanent tired. <laughs> it's just this is me tired. Um, well, and uh, we are, we are honoured today to have a very special industry guest join us. Uh, is the president of Velan is that right, isn't it? Guha, Velan Studios. Yeah, Velan Studios. Yeah. Hey, Guha, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thank you. Uh, uh, congratulations on the launch of Knockout City. I think I saw five million. Was that the number? It seems to be doing yeah, well. Yeah, we're um, you know steadily climbing, but uh, we crossed five million. Um, I don't know exactly when we released it, but it's it seems like it's a little while ago now. But uh, uh, but it was quick. You know, I got out there and, uh, uh, you know, the, some of that is the benefit of having cross-play uh, and cross-platform and uh, also doing a free trial, you know, for unlimited use, unloaded play in the first week. And so it was really, because Knockout City is a very different kind of game. You know, I think my brother went on record saying, you know, we wrote down, we wrote down the concept and tried to describe it in words and it sounded boring. So we realized that pretty early on, people had to have their hands on it to play it. They really enjoy it, and uh, that, that's been the case. So uh, we're excited to get it out there, and there's tons of new content coming. So uh, you know, the launch is just the start of these sorts of games, and so the folks here at Villain Studios, um, we're all uh, consistently updating, uh, pushing out new content every day and every week. Uh, we have a bunch of new things coming. You know, oh, wow. right or two. Have you worked on a game like this before? Because um, for readers, if readers don't know, listen, watchers, viewers, listeners, whoever you are, uh, don't know. Uh, you obviously ran, uh, founded and started Vicarious Visions before then. Have you worked on a game like this before? You know, it's interesting because we started Bell in the studio, my brother and I, so that we work on games that are very different than anything that we've done before. So, you know, even though our first game, Mario Kart Live Home Circuit, which is, you know, we, we got out there with Nintendo last uh, October, um, it was a mixed reality toy. Now we'd done hardware and software things before, but nothing quite like this, where we did the chip design, uh, the sourcing of, you know, we did the initial reference hardware. We worked closely with the hardware teams at Nintendo. We did all the software design for a, sort of a full mixed reality experience. Of course, Knockout City is completely different. It's a different kind of team-based action game, live services, multiplayer only cross-platform, cross-play, and cross-progression, which is a mouthful and also relatively recent to gaming. This is pretty new to us, too. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's the kind of challenge that we'd like to take on. Oh, good. Wow. I've, I've heard good things from the Eurogamer team. I've not I've not played it myself yet, um, but I hope to. Um, well, we're you here. Check it out. It's, uh, you could play free now. Yeah. You know, it, yeah. Uh, Here's the plug. <laughs> even after the initial free trial, we had, um, you know, we're just making it available free. Uh, oh, up to level 25, which gives you a beefy amount of gameplay that you could just play because it's important for it's a team based experience. And so uh, it's important for, our, you know, if you like it, to bring all your friends in and then you know, have to play together, basically. Mm. Well, we're here to talk about Nintendo because we are fresh yep. from the E3, uh, uh, the sort of the, not technically the end of E3, but pretty much was uh, Nintendo uh, uh, showcase. Um, uh, James, what did you, what did you make of it? You, I thought it was good. Um, it always amazes me how Nintendo, I feel like, is the one that everyone speculates about the most. Like in the run up to a Nintendo Direct, you have the most amazing like fan theories, predictions, conspiracies, like, oh, they are absolutely going to announce the Switch Pro and a Wind Waker Twilight Princess HD double pack and a Metroid themed update to Mario Maker and all these things. And no matter how much people predict, no matter how much people come up with, and you think, yeah, possibly they always come up with something completely different. I don't think anyone saw Metroid Dread or a, a, you know, an Advance Wars reboot coming. Like they, they always managed to surprise, which I, I, I enjoy as, as both a fan and, and someone very tired of watching very kind of dry, predictable E3 press conferences. I enjoy the surprises. 
I, I for one, did expect a 2D Metroid game. Um, but I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll speak to, uh, I'll speak to Brendan. What did you, what did you make of it? You're a little bit, you're typically more a little bit more cynical. Did it fill you with joy? <laughs> um, not, not quite. I needed something in the Kirby Epic Yarn Yoshi Willy World cozy crafts uh, genre to really spark <laughs> that joy in me. Um, but it was, it was not bad. It was like if everyone that came to E3 kind of met the the expectations that I typically have of the company, the way this Nintendo one did, it would be a pretty strong E3 all the way around. Um, mm-hmm. Like Breath of the Wild 2 is, it's a little disappointing it's not this year, but at least there's, it's, 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 it's coming and what they showed looked looked really cool and made me want to get back into that. Um, Advance Wars, I'm thrilled, is is coming back, even if it's just a uh, kind of a remake of the, of the first two. Um, the Game & Watch Legend of Zelda thing, kind of neat. It's nice that they haven't just completely uh, given up on, you know, that, that whole like retro hardware line, I guess, that started with the NES Classic. Um, I, I don't know. Nothing, nothing really like knocked me over and, and got me completely super stoked. Uh, except, except maybe Kazuya in smash brothers, which is weird. Cause I don't play smash brothers these days and haven't downloaded any of the fighters for it, but that yeah, was just will. a really well done introduction. I thought, and then when he's throwing everyone off the cliff, I was, that was my little like Tekken fanboy moment right there. I was, I was just, that was joy. Yeah. And then, then the rest of it was like, oh, Guardians of the Galaxy. That's interesting. Less interesting now that we know it's just a cloud-based uh, version of the game and not something that's being, you know, like potentially a Switch Pro kind of uh, product. But yeah, it, I may be cynical, but I can't, I can't complain or, or knock it too much. Like it, yeah. it, seemed, it seemed good, it seemed solid. I know a lot of people enjoyed it a lot more than I did. Yeah. I'd be intrigued to know how well those cloud versions do because like that has been a way of getting games that are far too powerful or far too far too big for the you know the, the switch's hardware which every time I take it out of the dock and take the joy cons off to have to remind me is basically a tablet um like Assassin's Creed Odyssey, Control, Hitman 3, now Gardens of the Galaxy like it's a way of getting those massive massive games on there. I don't know how many people actually try that right you know have the, the, the you know, the solid internet connection to enjoy them. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, I did ask uh, IO Interactive recently and they said they were very happy with it, which was a good non-answer. Uh, Guha, what did you make of uh, Nintendo today? Well, you know, I think um, they did, they, they do sort of have a methodology, which is they have a way to delight their fans with lots of gameplay. That's very mechanics heavy presentation, meaning uh, they do some of the, teaser type things. They did that last time with Splatoon, you know, for example, or the, earlier in the spring with Splatoon, um, you know, this year. But that's the exception rather than the role. So most of the content in the Nintendo Direct is typically, here's the gameplay you're going to see. Yeah. And uh, especially as you get close to release, it's all about gameplay and that kind of thing. So I really enjoy that. And of course, the classics, I'm a huge fan, Advance Wars and the others uh, as well. So uh, there's such craftsmanship in those classics that it's really worthwhile seeing those again. So I really like that. Uh, the 2022 date for uh, Zelda, it's a, it seems like ever, you know, so many of the big titles are 2022. Yeah. This was probably the E3. I've seen, you know, it, we haven't, it, it's been a little while since there've been such long lead times from when like essentially a cinematic trailer or a teaser drops. To, to a game that's 18 months plus away. We used to do that all the time, mm-hmm. you know, but that used to be like 10 years ago when you'd have long lead times and that kind of thing. And, um, you know, most companies have, uh, you know, gone to, you know, three months or less, sometimes even dropping the title and it's available now and uh, going to that method. So this is a little surprising. It makes me think that pandemic had a bigger impact in terms of internal production for titles than anybody has really come to realize because especially when you're integrating these large AAA games, it's less so for small games, large AAA games, that final bit of 
polish, play balance, editing, again, requires quite a lot of collaboration. Mm -hmm. I think the remote work might have had an impact on it. So I was surprised, you know, overall, not just for Nintendo, but for everybody, you know, when we look at the, um, uh, you know, the stuff from the Bethesda presentation and, you know, stuff like that. It's just, uh, there were a lot of titles for 2022 that were shown very early this year. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Case, so go on, Chris. Well, it's interesting because um, I actually, it's interesting because there was, there was also quite a few for 2021, but I actually felt that, that those were games that were like Forza Horizon 5 and things, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy is this year. And there's just a few of those that um, I think perhaps would have been announced a lot earlier. I have to wonder if, co you know, if you don't quite know when you're going to ship, if you're going to make this year or not, you're not going to announce too early, are you? You're going to have to, you're going to get closer to the... Uh... Well, that part doesn't, I mean, uh, you're right. I mean, I think we've got a good uh, lineup for this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm excited for Guardians personally, and uh, Forza is a, a great staple as well. And um, if you announce too early, it seems like you lose, it, like you have to kind of re reacquire all that attention again. Mm -hmm. And so the pattern of announcing about three months ahead of time uh, to four months ahead of time, I think is more than normal now than it used to be. Mm. Um, and so that, well, well, that was what was surprising me about next year's titles, like yeah. announcing them now for something that's a while away. I think, I think if Nintendo didn't show Breath of the Wild 2, I think- they Maybe they had a small <laughs> insurrection on their hand. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's maybe in demand for the last two years because yeah. nintendo do actually they're actually one of typically there are quite a few exceptions but typically they're the ones that do announce quite late because that was your game mario kart last year mm -hmm. right they announced it in september and released it a month later and knockout yeah. city as well but oh no that, that was also part of the direct i know it wasn't a, a nintendo game um mm -hmm. where they sort of announced that quite late and i was actually i think my take on it is that again i didn't i'm really like i, I always because i've got this commercial sales figure brain I am always looking at things thinking, where's their big game for Christmas? And there wasn't one, right? You know, they've got Pokemon, which is good. It's a big game. Um, but there wasn't like a, I was like, you know, oh, is it Zelda? Is there going to be a Donkey Kong with a new Mario? You know, what's, what is it? What is there going to be their big Christmas title? And there really wasn't. I mean, Mario Party, uh, I have to say, I keep forgetting this Mario Party, which they announced. Mario Party, last one did like 15 million copies, which is phenomenal success. That's actually a really big game. Um, so there was there are there are some big ones metroid dread i mean i love metroid i'm really excited about that myself personally but it, again it's not a big hit it's metroid's got a very core fan base normally made mostly in the u.s so um i was i was uh i was expecting something that was a bit like oh this is this is gonna really shit you know they expect to sell 25 million consoles this financial year so i was i was looking to see what was going to do that and um but um, but it was but I enjoyed it like as a fan. I'm also a big fan of Super Monkey Ball. I love Super Monkey Ball. So the fact that they're, they're the first two are being remastered is excites me. Um, and, that game uh, was the most frustrating game for me. <laughs> you, know, so, you know, you think you start getting good and you realize how really awful you are. And I just keep repeating the same maps over and over again. It's just unbelievable. For me, I, I do enjoy the single player a little bit, but I love the, there's a multiplayer mode called Monkey Flight, where you just, or Monkey Target rather, where you're supposed to drop a monkey. And I used to play it with my friends, first two monkey balls, really good. And I was really just pleased about that. I was really excited about that. And there's WarioWare. There's quite a lot, actually, if you start mm -hmm. reading off all the all the stuff that was announced and shown. So I thought I'm sorry to interrupt here, Chris. I can't talk about Monkey Ball that long. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you about your, uh, the holiday plan thing. With, with, Nintendo, what do you think their big holiday game was last year? Me? Yeah. Um, I don't think they had one last year either, but um, no. I guess I guess the biggest game they had was Super the, the, the Mario Collection. Right, and that was announced in September, right? Yeah. And launched announced. like three years later, and that was the, the September thing was the big Mario 35th anniversary direct, yeah. right? And that, that filled in a lot of the, the gaps. Uh, we've got like Hyrule Warriors and Game and & Watch um, and Skyward Sword now, but Nintendo hasn't been branding any of this really as like the big 35th anniversary celebration thing. They even I... said like in the direct, like we have no other Zelda titles or events planned for like this yeah. anniversary, which I, I found quite disappointing. Seeing how big they no, were on Mario. That. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, they, actually, they actually said, like, yeah, we have, they are tempering those expectations right away. Like, because again, there's been all this speculation on what they can do for the, the 35th, because the 35th anniversary of Zelda was back in February. 
and they did nothing for it. They announced, I think there was a direct around the time when they announced Skyward Sword. And it's like, great, the most divisive, perhaps most, you know, like least popular Zelda in history. That's your big release for this year. And then some amiibos and stuff like, and yeah, in this one, they, you know, they, it's the game and watch. And they said like, we have no other games or um, things planned, which I think is a kind of a missed opportunity. I know that, I know that the 35th anniversary of any franchise is somewhat an arbitrary kind of <laughs> milestone to, to celebrate. Um, but they went so big on Mario and there is so little in terms of big, uh, yeah, as, as Chris has been saying, there's so little like big stuff in the lineup that they, it feels like there was room for even, even just an Animal Crossing event or a, you know, an expansion of that, that kind of a Mario Maker update they did you know, where you can get the, the original NES Zelda. Like, it felt like they should have done something to even like, acknowledge the Zelda and Metroid anniversaries this year and they've, they've decided not to. Yeah, I, mean, I wonder if Breath of the Wild 2 was set for that originally. Yeah, yeah it could be. No, I mean, and I think that uh, from my perspective, these guys are, uh, you, know, you know, Nintendo in particular is not so much a formula company. So the uh, 35th Mario was something that all came together and it made sense for that. But then if they did the same thing for other franchises, which, you know, deserve it. I mean, they're, they're, they have so many amazing ones. Then we start looking a little... Like, okay, you know, I've seen that one before. And then it starts setting very specific comparisons. And uh, game development doesn't really lend itself to that, especially if you're into crafting the products. So they're, they all operate on slightly different timelines and their creative output pops up at different points. So I think in some ways the 35th was a good coincidence of a lot of things, but not designed as something to replicate. I mean, that's total speculation on my part. I don't. Well, I don't no, know. no, but I, I have to wonder. No, I have to speculate the same thing. There was the Lego Zelda collect, a uh, Mario collection. There was the game that you worked on, the uh, mm -hmm. Mario Kart game. There was um, you had the um, uh, you had the Mario Bowser's Fury thing they're working on. They just ended up having this thing. Well, hang on, we've got a load of Mario games here. <laughs> you've got Paper Mario, and it was and it they and it, it was then they were. And I just felt like it felt like a good thing to wrap that up into, into a banner and, and that kind of thing. I wouldn't be surprised if that was the thing they did rather than plan five years out to have six Mario games launched. I think what they do is they look at, you know, great creative output. When is the right time, you mm -hmm. know, for that? And they saw an opportunity, uh, you know, and they said, okay, well, this is a nice presentation of it. Yeah. And that might be nothing um, really, um, you, you know, it's important when the creative is a priority not to be too, too planful on the time line, timelines until you get close. So I think they, they thought that this was probably a good opportunity is my guess. Um, now in terms of the other, the other thing about, you know, their big holiday game, one thing they've been very consistent on is it's not just the games that we're coming out with now. It's the great games that we have for all of our new Switch customers. Mm -hmm. So they, they've been the best about one, maintaining price and then, uh, you know, making sure that all the games that they have in the library are good for all the new customers coming in. And it's not just the new games that the new customers value, which is very different than most others. Yeah. Most others, most other large game companies don't get credit for the vast library they have with the new players coming in. It's all about what's the big message now. And so that's always been important to their balance. And, and they've done a good job of that. That's, the, that's actually a good point because I, uh, I said the Mario 3D collection was probably the big Nintendo game of last Christmas, but actually it was probably Animal Crossing that was actually the big game of last Christmas. Oh, totally. Yeah, that is totally that. I mean, at least, especially in my household. Yeah. Um, I mean, I couldn't, you know, to be honest, my girls played Mario Kart Live, but they played Animal Crossing more. Which <laughs> it's sort of like an eternally crushing moment, but, you know, I'm definitely. Play. Well, and, and it's, it's a good point. And, you know, what I, the reason, I'm talking about engagement right now because we're into the fifth year of the Switch, which isn't unusual for this to be a big year for PlayStation or Xbox, but Nintendo to get to this point is, is not that common. So I was trying to see what was the game, but you know, there's quite a lot and it's more, perhaps there's a, rather than one big game, there's lots of moderate sized ones is fine. And I think this is, I was wrestling with this before I joined this call was what's my view on it? Was was I disappointed or was I happy? And I And I thought, I was probably neither. I was, I was, I was, as a fan, I was excited. Um, as an analyst, I'm like, yeah, it's probably going to be okay. Um, but as Brendan says as well, Nintendo didn't say this was our full lineup for the year. Um, I don't, I wouldn't, I'd be surprised if there's anything particularly sizable, particularly when you look at the, the quite a few games in October, and November, and even December. But um, you know, I, I, I suspect it was. But Guha, you've done these um, mm -hmm. uh, direct. You did the last. You in the last two. Uh, what's what's that process like? Is it super intense? Is it easy? I mean, 
I don't know. Well, I, don't I, know think, what... I mean, the number one job is to have great content, right? I mean, that's, that's sort of what it is. And, and we look for when we, when we looked at, I mean, in the case of Mario Kart Live, it's pretty evident, right? I mean, it's going to be on a, a direct because it's a mm -hmm. Nintendo game. Um, and in the case of Knockout City, um, you know, because uh, that game in particular for Switch, you know, I think our earliest prototypes were on Switch, um, you know, for Knockout right. City. So um, it, it was a game that was so, you know, it, it's so good to play on that system. And, uh, you know, we were able to squeeze out every ounce of performance from it too. Uh, from our perspective, we run at 60 FPS for a competitive gaming mode uh, for Knockout City and the game mechanics are balanced. So your win-loss ratios are gonna be, um, you know, very close, if not exact to other systems as well. It was hard for a competitive multiplayer game. Most people break cross-play and cross-compatibility to be able to do that um, uh, and get, give a game on Switch, but you know we didn't. So we're we're a close part partners. You know we try to do as good a job as we possibly can for the system. And you know that you know the Nintendo Direct in particular was a good way to be able to say, all right, it's time to announce. Let's get to as many consumers that this game could be really good for, you know, as mm -hmm. possible. So that was the thought process in that. And that, that, that has to totally line up with a partner, right? It has to totally line up with what, uh, where Nintendo was at the time. Um, but it was also the case that we were in state of play uh, yeah. about a week later. Uh, and then, um, uh, you know, of course, the, the game is available on Game Pass. And so we were yeah. supported broadly by all first parties on that, on that title. Yeah. Does that not does that not create some form of conflict? Is, is that not a concern when, you know, if a PlayStation going, hang on, We've got we've got this sloppy seconds, um, or is that is that something you have to address when you make well, this decision? Well, we want to make sure that each you know we're giving value to the partner mm -hmm. for each one, and that the content is really good and applicable to that you know uh, the the first party's you know audience as well. So that's super important. So in the case of Nintendo, it was the it was the announcement, it was the trailer, mm -hmm. uh, and that kind of thing. In the case of State of Play, it was a deep dive on gameplay. And it, it, you know that that format really lent itself well to that, and it was exclusive to them uh, for a period of time. And so they all have different beats, and it's part of a media plan and so forth. It's it's very important to us to make sure that you know, none of them are second fiddle, so to speak, mm -hmm. because ultimately, you know, what matters is that the players that are playing on the systems get a great experience, right? So that was also why pretty much everything that's available to you on a PS5 or a PS4, except 4K, right? Is, is available to you on a Switch. You know, so the full gameplay goes across. Yeah. So very important for us to have feature parity, which doesn't mean bringing PS5 down, it means bringing, make sure that we push the envelope and bring everything on Switch up. So these are the ways that we balance it. We make sure that there's value to the partner, there's value to that partner's customer, basically. Have the attitudes of the platform holders changed much over the years? Because it, things like crossplay, even mm -hmm. they've they've definitely softened. You know, ten years ago, I would never have imagined that to be a thing that was possible. Uh, are are they are they a little less? Um, you know, is there more leeway about feeling second fiddle now than there was before? Because they they don't. I think Chris has mentioned this many times. They, they don't seem to be competing as directly or having the same goals to, to accomplish these days as they used to? Well, I think that um, a few things, I think the philosophy around a platform being a walled garden has softened a little bit uh, because I, I don't think players want that anymore. Uh, and so I think it's really been a consumer movement that's fueled it and some key titles that have helped change that. So I think Fortnite really helped change the concept of crossplay in a big way and the benefits of it too. And it took a while to navigate for all the first parties to get to the same spot, uh, you know, with it. There's been a big change, you know, in a world where you're playing an unconnected game on a disc, which was the bulk of games like 20 years ago anyway, it didn't matter. Because if you're playing with your friends, you're playing locally multiplayer. But in a connected world, nobody really has enough of a presence within their own network to say, well, that's where all my friends are going to be. And of course, that's the way people played in this kind of in-between generation, you know, for a long time with PS3 as well as PS4, same with Xbox 360 and Xbox One, you know, as well. Um, and, um, you know, consumers have come to expect something different, which is basically like you play on your platform, I play on mine, and then, you know, we want to play together. 
And so I think all of the first parties have aligned to, we can make both an economic system work um, by supporting that, which is like if you, if you buy, if you purchase a microtransact on one, you know, there's a direct attribution of revenue you know, to that first party. So people, the first parties get to participate in that economy, but the economy itself gets bigger and the player communities get bigger. They just get more consumers playing with each other constantly. Mm. And I think so it's become a win-win for consumers as well as first parties in that regard. So I think that it's, it's just a, it, it, there was a time where even the platforms were designed to make development of cross-platform titles difficult for developers. <laughs> but the chip architecture was so different that actually doing cross-platform development was a competitive edge for developer. It was sort of like totally not, you, you know, you want to make it as easy for developers to make games. But, but some first parties weren't like that. But that world has changed, I think, and, and it's for the better. Nintendo obviously terrible for that, for like not just the chip ar architecture, but also like the hardware and like the inputs as well. Like you know, you know, you can't port a DS game to PSP because it hasn't got two screens, for example. Like Nintendo have always, you know, certainly for the last two or three generations, tried to do their own thing and trying to separate themselves, and that does mean that the vast majority of games made for them are only made for them, which is why it's, it always. Well, That's actually, let, let me kind of um, challenge that for a minute, James, because I wasn't thinking of Nintendo when I made that comment. So somebody else. But anyway, <laughs> um, so let's not talk about the PS3. Yeah, mm -hmm. no, but the, but, but the, um, the thing around that, that, that kind of paradigm still exists, you know, in the sense of like um, the differentiation strategy for Nintendo in the past has been, look, let me drive the price point of the hardware down and work with as simple hardware as possible to create a different kind of gaming experience. So that's why they're like, you know, two screens actually offer this, like with Nintendo Dogs, a different kind of interactivity than something else. So they were always thinking about that. I, I think it was less about cross-platform and more about how is our platform distinctive uh, from a consumer experience standpoint. You know, that said, then it makes it tough, right? <laughs> you know, so it, it, it is difficult to do cross-platform in that sense. You know, I have an experience translate. But, let, but let's let's not forget, Guha, that you bought, uh, I bring up for the third time in about a couple of months, you ported Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 2 to the Game Boy Advanced in, in brilliant fashion. Sure. So, uh, sure. it's, it was a different game. It wasn't ported. We had to develop well, no, it. No, it was a different that. game. That's true. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, look, I mean, one of the good things is that no matter what that is, um, you have, I mean, forget about what we did, but you always have developers around the world doing something clever, you know, for them mm -hmm. too. And that, that's what I like to see. Yeah. Well, I mean, have you been watching much else of E3? Is it just intended? Do you watch? Do you have seen? Been paying attention all weekend? What have you made? Yeah, of it? yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm trying to, I'm trying to grab as much as I can. But you know, in this world of end-to-end -end live streaming, it's like, uh, well, th that that is actually your world. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're trying to run a live gaming here as well. So we try to get I try to get snippets and summaries, but also try to go deep on the some of the games I'm really interested in as well. So um it has been really interesting because it's been easier to get more information on more things uh this way um okay. so in that sense it's like in a typical e3 um you know for publisher structure it would be you have a media briefing you also have one-on-one -on -one interview time you have hands-on game play time and then there's, it's almost like an amusement park e3 itself like you, you have the lines, you have to get people in, you have to get people out. You have to, you know, it's like, it's, it's really, you have to crank it. And I've been on the other side of that, supporting all the media work and, and communications for, you know, back in the day it was Activision. And then before that, uh, Vicarious. And it still limits the reach in a big way. And so you can get much deeper on more products with the consumers that are really interested in those products. Um, you can't get hands-on gameplay, so that's not available. But uh, but you can do a lot more of that in this current context, and so there's a lot of, a lot of rich content out there. I, I would have liked to see more gameplay than cinematics, though. I would say that that's the one thing because you know I'm maybe old and crusty, but I don't get excited by cinematics anymore. No, well, but gamers get excited by logos. It's all they need um, uh, to to send the crowd into into frenzy. Sometimes, yeah, I, I, I don't, don't get it I myself. Don't, I, don't, I don't love it because I, I you know I do love the franchises and stuff, and I do love new ideas. But our medium is interactive. It's not a movie. <laughs> so I want to be seeing more gameplay, you know, even if it's in a stream. What do you want to see from E3 2022, assuming it returns to at least partially in person? Well, I, I would like to see 
Um, a combination of, I would like to see a lot of gameplay, you know, in the live streams, but I would actually love to see more hands-on, uh, uh, I'd like to see something that could be hands-on for both North American as well as European consumers. So you could run that on a multi-site basis. Um, I think there's an opportunity for streamers to get in and play and offer that content on a broader basis. So consumers are getting closer to the actual experience. Our, our industry is notorious for driven demos, which is basically the developer showing you what a gameplay sequence can be, but with all the limitations of a buggy in development product. And the, the real challenge with that is it's good to develop hype, but it's actually not a good reflection of the quality of the game. So I'd like to see more hands-on from people that could, they hear the good things that are coming out and here's why they're really special. Mm -hmm. So I think that that actually moves us in the right direction. Um, the physical trade show presence was really good for business meetings, it was good for energy, but it was it's, it's really an artifact of, um, I need a place where I could show retail buyers what they need to stock for Christmas. And we're just not there anymore. You know, I think that we're in a spot where you know, every company can reach, reach a retail buyer by going and visiting them because that oh, part many. is relatively <laughs> consolidated and you can do it more efficiently than a single event in, in a single location. Things get distributed to do it these days. Um, There's, I a lot of that too. There's a lot of, a lot of um, well, I mean, the distributors largely move the boxes, but they, you know, they're rep groups, they're distributors that are talking to retailers. And then the key accounts are managed by publishers uh, directly. And there it's in every territory, it's like three or four key accounts dominate. And yeah. so it's a different structure it's in the world. And it, so I think it, it, it's a rethink to say, how do I make this better for consumers? Mm -hmm. There's something yeah. definitely missing from like a media, highly produced media event. that's like 90 minutes long with trailers and trailers and trailers. Um, there's something missing from that. And I think what's missing is the hands-on gameplay, the kind of the really bringing it alive for the community. And we've got the tools and tech to do it. You know, yeah. we should be doing that. I remember the um, the Breath of the Wild. It was a necessity. Nintendo had nothing else to show. And they went to E3 with just Breath of the Wild. And their presentation was just Breath of the Wild. And then they had a tree house afterwards where they went, they did a load of gameplay on Breath of the Wild. Mm -hmm. And the media went to their booth and all they had was that to play. I think there was a Pokemon game as well. But really, that's all they had to play. The whole booth was built around it. And mm -hmm. I kind of felt like this was, I actually thought, I had a initially I was disappointed. When I got there, I suddenly realized that what they've done is they've laser focused in on a wonderful game. And they kind of stole the show with one game. And, um, and I sort of look back at that E3 and I look at that model. And I think, well, imagine if that was available, consumers could sort of engage in that in a more active way, not just watching the stream, but actually playing it, maybe even coming along and seeing that spectacle. Um, well, I was talking about this yesterday, uh, yesterday with Brendan and, and James saying, I, I do wonder if, particularly with fewer games, AAA games uh, anyway, being made and everything that perhaps it's a... Uh, well, I was at uh, BlizzCon and I was there with um, a, a Bobby Kotick and there was another, there was a sort of another person with us that was from the music industry that did live shows for like Michael Jackson. Um, and we were walking around and um, uh, he was like, wow, well, look at BlizzCon. What if we bring in celebrities? What if we you know, bring in Angelina Jolie and she can be dressed as Queen of Blades and you know, some, some like that. And, and what came across my mind and what we started talking about was, look at this, there are 40,000 people here. There are people paying pay-per-view. And that's half the size of E3 around a couple of products. You know, it wasn't a huge library at the time, not as big as today. Um, and uh, it was around a couple of products. But everybody was there that was there was either a Blizzard employee or community members that had come there. They paid to come there to be able to be part of the community. And the fact that it wasn't highly produced meant that community members could dress up and they'd do the cosplay and they'd be celebrated for being community members as opposed to celebrities. And that's the character I think we need to have. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like, how do you make it for the community and make it for the players and make it for the consumers? And then make it as interactive as possible and bring creators closer to that. That's interesting. And it's, a, it's sort of a real contrast with the way that we think about entertainment producing. We don't need to Photoshop, you know, we don't need to kind of make that uh, you know, experience uh, so plastic uh, and celebrity driven. We can make it more for the consumers. And I, I think that was a really powerful thing. It was like a way I'd understood it mentally 
But I was walking there. We had this guy that does these things. And I was like, but that's not what makes this thing tick. That's not what makes it sell out in seconds. I will, interesting because this... at this point uh, interject and just recommend that people read Brendan's The Four Types of Celebrity Appearances, uh, which you ran <laughs> last week, mm-hmm. um, which nicely categorizes, yeah, the use of celebrities at events like E3. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's definitely worth a read. This was quite a Hollywood E3, I actually felt. Because, yeah, you had Ryan Reynolds and you had a load of celebrities doing Jeff Keighley's thing and stuff. But more than that, there was uh, almost every showcase had some, for, apart from maybe Nintendo, but I can't think of one. But they had like some, you know, the big game for uh, Square Enix was Guardians of the Galaxy. There was a big Pirates of the Caribbean thing on the, 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 the Xbox stage. There was films. If you watch the E3 live stream, in between it, they're promoting that film with Ryan Reynolds in. They're promoting uh, movies and Netflix is doing a thing. E3 has always had a Hollywood element to it, but it really is interesting to see that that, that I assume that's because it was in L.A., Right, and it seems to really uh, continued here. But I, you know, it isn't. You watch, you watch how disinterested you watch the chat. I mean, I don't try not to, but you watch the chat when Ryan Reynolds is on. No, but the gamers don't care. Like they're not, they're not. It's it's more for Ryan Reynolds that than it is for the gamers. And nothing. I would be more interested in Ryan Reynolds talking about games, like that he likes and plays, like him as a player, as opposed mm. to him as a celebrity. Because I bet he plays. Yeah. Well, Jack Black I, last I, year, last E3 oh, yeah. I went to, did a similar thing. Because obviously, he's a big gamer. Um, yeah. Go on, James. I was going to say, uh, Ryan Reynolds, like, I, I, I think he plays, but not avidly. Like, I, I, I've seen a YouTube video of um, someone trying to play the Deadpool game with it. There was a Deadpool game years ago before the films uh, playing with Ryan Reynolds. I think he plays for about five minutes and then hands it over to the other, you know, yeah. the journalist or the presenter. Saying, like, You're probably going to enjoy this more. Um so yeah. I mean, it's a, it is a effective promotion technique, you know, yeah. and it's tried and true. We did um, for Knockout City, we did a promotion with Brie Larson. She did a live stream oh, but she's big uh, on YouTube. She's yeah. a Nintendo's brand ambassador. So mm-hmm. she was playing on Switch competitively against PC players. Uh, but a few things, I mean, she's a gamer. She actually really loves to play. Oh, yeah. But ahead of time, we made sure she liked it, you know? And so what she was doing is really... Um, doing something that she likes to do except communicating with her you know, mm-hmm. fan base this is really something right so in that in that sense in that sense uh what i think could be effect- what i think can be effective in this case this was the spirit in which we did it is the same way that you, you know you, you know a twitch streamer would talk to his yeah. audience or her audience right well, May or as- lyric or whoever right in that sense in their world they are celebrities and they're trying to play products and communicate with their community so it's it's not so different than that. Yeah, no, tastefully, it, authentic, isn't it? So I mean, yeah, Jack authentic Black, is key. Yeah, Jack Black in Tony Hawk's, for instance, like he's a huge. I know he is. He's been. He's, in, he's always talked about it. Even oh, James Batcher and I are fans of Nacious D. It's it's come up on videos before. So him being in that game and working with your your former friends at my case right. on that was uh, was was an obvious was an obvious partnership, and it was good. He promoted it, and I think he was supposed to announce it, and then and then. And you sort of see that um, uh, in Zelda Williams, let's not forget who, uh, when Zelda 25th anniversary uh, mm-hmm. became sort of an ambassador for Zelda because, of course, she was named after the game. And it was there, there was some, although, I, you know, there, there are some where that doesn't work, obviously. But, you know, if it's authentic, it feels, it feels, um, well, it was interesting that Nintendo rolled her out as an interview subject for Skyward Sword, which I found very strange. <laughs> it's like I'm not entirely sure. Um, that's the best um, use of, of use of that. Um, Guha, what is your um, actually? Uh, Brendan's on this. Brendan hasn't joined us on these podcasts yet, so I'll ask Brendan actually this first. Brendan, what is your what E three's gone by? What has been your E three memory? What has been your my E three memory is I, honestly it's it's mostly just a bit of concern for the ESA. Um. Because I, I think one of the the big things that have stood out for me this year is like Sony's not here again. Uh, Electronic Arts isn't here, and they're not even doing their EA Play in the you know in the general time frame like they have in years past. And so much of what we've seen from like the official E3 schedule has not been well received because the you know, the publishers didn't really have a whole lot to show or things like there was an indie showcase and, and the ESA made a big deal about this. They put out a press release trying to get coverage saying like, Hey, we're really supporting and uplifting indies at this year's show. 
and it was a 15 minute indie showcase where they showed like six or seven indie games. Um, and that is such a small sliver mm -hmm. of, of indies that I was like, it, it, the show felt incomplete to me because of how few parts there were that, that really um, commanded attention the way it normally does when you have Bethesda and Microsoft as separate conferences, Ubisoft and EA, and you go see one and then you have to race across the street to get into the other one yeah. before it starts. And then you have Sony capping off that big day that starts with Microsoft and then Nintendo starting the next morning. And it's just E3 as it is right now, it, it feels incomplete. And I don't, I don't know how, um, I mean, e even looking at the, the branding around this, so many of the Twitter accounts for Ubisoft, for Microsoft, for Nintendo barely even mention E3. In years past, they would be using the official hashtag. They would be, they would be billing this as their big E3 media showcase instead of like Ubisoft Forward and Microsoft Bethesda Games Showcase. And I think it's part of it's just like having to go without E3 last year, without even the ESA giving them like some kind of time frame to put all their their announcements around. I think the industry is, has gotten an idea as to what life without an E3 would be like. I think what I'm reassured by is that I think it's E3, and Guha mentioned this earlier as well, E3, the, the function of it, is at the moment under threat. Like what the ROI, like why do you spend loads of money on a booth? You know, you not really need it for retailers anymore. You don't necessarily need it for media. So why are you, why do you go to E3? And um, that's a good question. And that's something that for the ESA to find, to work out. But what I was reassured of is that people did come together. And when you're doing digitally, there's no point in getting people to rush over to EA, right? There's no people, there's no point in going, right, you've gone watch the Ubisoft press conference, now rush over the road to watch you, because we have to condense it into a week. They don't have to do that now. Um, I do think the live stream, because it's been, it, oddly, despite the fact there's quite a few things happened over the last four, four or five days, it felt spread out really thin, like, you know, and I think that's because it, it is. <laughs> but, um, but it's, um, but I, I, what I was reassured with is that, you know, Nintendo, Xbox, Square Enix, Capcom, uh, take two to a lesser extent. Um, and then a bunch of the people, even Sony, Sony had three announcements in Jeff Keighley's thing. And I hear rumors that they're, they're going to do something soon. Um, even, you know, they all see value in being close together. And um, it's, it's just that, you know, beforehand, I was always worried that if E3 stopped existing, would, would Ubisoft and all those people feel the need to still go to a central place and get the whole industry together to get the media, the, the mainstream media in? But looking at what they've done this year, it suggests to me they do value the, 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 the effect of all of them coming together and how that raises everything and raises attention and stuff. I mean, that's why I, I think yes, they have to work out and maybe it's the consumer stuff. Maybe it's, it's that kind of thing, what, what it is E3 does now. Um, and I suspect it's very hard to get all of their members to... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to agree on what it is that they want to do. That's my feeling anyway. But I was quite, I, did, I quite enjoyed it because actually if you, Ubisoft, I enjoyed Ubisoft's conference. I enjoyed Jeff Keighley's thing. I enjoyed the Nintendo one. I enjoyed the Microsoft one. And those were the four big moments, right? Um, but actually, Brendan, when I, what I was asking you was of all time, like what was your big E3 moment? What has been like oh. your, your, uh, <sighs> your memory? <sighs> That you can tell us on the podcast. <laughs> Honestly, my favorite uh, E3 memory was from, uh, I think it was Konami's E3 2010 show, which was is is largely considered just an absolute disastrous conference, one of <laughs> one of the worst to to ever take place. But uh, there was a segment in there where they had um, like uh, Karaoke Revolution Glee game coming out and they had like a local renowned high school glee club come in to this you know little auditorium inside the la convention center that seats you know 100 150 people or something and just do like a acapella version of um queen's uh what somebody to love and wow. it was like, you'd think that it was uh, silly, because we've certainly seen silly stuff at E3, but like to be in that room and 
that performance from a bunch of high school kids was like, I don't know. It was, it, it, it was, it, it cut through whatever cynicism that I have about E3 and all the, you know, it just exists to, to hype people up with, you know, style over substance and everything like that. But, you know, it kind of cut through that. And for, you know, three minutes, I was sat there in the auditorium just with like goosebumps. Cause this is like, wow, this is a really cool performance by people that are incredibly stoked to be here. I don't cutting, think I've ever heard cutting any. through Brendan's cynicism is no small feat. Yeah. That is impressive. <laughs> There's not much else. You get underneath the cynicism and you're almost back through the center to the other side <laughs> of the cynicism. Well, I'm conscious it's of the it's time. a nugget of me in there. I'm conscious of the time, so I'll try and wrap up by actually asking Guha, what is your what, what, E3 memory? I mean, I actually remember speaking to you, Guha, at E3. I think the Skylanders game at some point. It might that was brother. it, I'm sure. But, um, I'm sure yeah. that was the moment. Um, <laughs> but outside of that highlight, when you showed me Skylanders, I think it was your brother actually. I think you might pop your head in. Um, what is your um, what was what's been? It's actually one of the uh, you know it's a little while ago. It was related to actually Tony Hawk's Pro Skater for uh, GBA, and oh. it was probably in maybe in 2000. It was the year before we released it, and we had this idea. We knew the GBA was coming. We had started working with some hardware and you know that kind of thing. And, um, as an indie developer, we had some concept art. Uh, I just bought a color laser printer, which was a lot of money uh, for me at the time. And uh, we put together some screenshots as to what this game could look like and had a proposal. We'd done a, a successful game with Activision at the time. We'd made a Game Boy Color game for Spider-Man. And so we're going to have a conversation uh, with them about new stuff that's coming out. And so I went had in hand to go and pitch them Tony Hawk for GBA because Tony Hawk was just breaking out at the time. Uh, the first one had come out, it's doing well. Two was about to come out, but it hadn't come out yet. It was in development. And uh, I went there, Activision had in its booth, a half pipe, some skateboarders and things like that. I met a tall guy and I started pitching him, but I didn't look up. I just you know, saw, saw him and I showed a concept card and started pitching. It turned out it was Tony Hawk. <laughs> Oh, wow. And uh, I was like, hey, this is the game that we can make for you, uh, about you. And he was like, oh, it looks pretty cool. And then we went up and had the meeting with, it was now a good friend of mine, Larry Goldberg. He was uh, running product development at Activision at the time. And um, I talked to him about it. And he was like, yeah, you know, you guys think you can do it? Go for it. And uh, we did. Oh, so wow. it was sort of nice. the indie developer does a good game then you know wants to take more risk and the publisher believes in them and you go for it and of course like we got back and we we're like okay now we have to build it we got to figure out how to do it um and so that that was like i mean i still remember it crystal clear you know wow kind of, and it probably defined us for many years later because we always set out to do things that are not obviously possible to do wow so, that is quite an e that's quite a defining moment not an e3 moment um, mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Guha. Thank you for staying on for a little bit longer than we planned. Um, uh, cheers for joining us. And thanks everyone who's watching on YouTube or listening to us on, uh, on all the podcasting platforms. I don't know which ones you're using. You're already using it, so there's no need for me to tell you. Um, uh, if you, um, uh, uh, we, we will be doing a few more of these over the next couple of weeks, but we'll probably take a pause for now, seeing as it's the end of E3. But uh, do stay tuned to us later in the week when we'll be doing our normal Games and, games and Job is podcast. We sort of wrap up. What we just uh, what we've just experienced over the last uh, seven days. Thank you all for joining us, and we'll see you next time.